very good evening to you, our esteemed viewers. It's our pleasure that your eyes have been on Church of Uganda Family TV since morning up to this point where we bring you the Transformed Lives program. And this program is brought to you by Church of Uganda Family TV in partnership with Full Gospel Business Men's Fellowship International. And we, are, we always have gatherings breakfast meetings where we share transformational stories and i believe by the time we live very many lives are transformed so today we are blessed to have mr guy john bugembe one of the chapter members of full gospel business uh, men's fellowship Muyenga chapter sharing with us his transformational story i believe by the time he concludes his story, your life will have been transformed and you'll have been strengthened, encouraged, and you'll have a reason to live again and to believe again. Edwin Austin Mukalazi is my name. I'm with Jonah Jal, the producer, and in transmission, there is the one and only Patrick. Let's dive into the transformational story of Mr. Guy John Bogembe. We shall be right back. Yes, I feel honored to be here and I thank God for this opportunity to be here and share with you my story. My name is John Gaibugembe, a member of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, Muyenga Chapter, married to Proskovia, uh, four biological children, all adults now, and many other children we look after. I am a member of the St. Stephen Chisugu Church of Uganda and uh, I'm gradually transiting into retirement. I am honored to be here and I want to pray that at the end of my sharing you will evaluate your own walk with Christ or with God and perhaps evaluate your own intentions. So I'm honored to be here. I lived with my aunt, the elder sister to my father. And I think I first recognized my father when I was about six. It's possible he was coming to visit us, but I was too young to understand. At around six, I understood my father. And that's when I started knowing what it meant to have a father. And at about the same age, I came to understand my mother when she came to visit us. My mother had to be taken back to school after my birth. And I came to know my mother at around six years. My, my auntie loved me so much and cared for me. And later on I started school. My father uh, made sure I start school in that little village. There was a school. Uh, fortunately, the standards of education were still very good, even in the villagers. And I thank God I went to a very active school. And I was introduced to Christ, God and Christ, early. When I was about, when I was about seven years, uh, that's when my father divorced his first wife. Uh, for me, it was a no-go-zone uh, area because my coming brought a crisis. It was a, a no-go-zone uh, for me. So my father divorced his wife, uh, I think I was about seven, and that's when my aunt took me there to visit my father in town here, very close in town here. He had a very good home. I met my siblings for the first time. I was very happy. We connected very well up to later in life. And then about the same age again, my mother had started working after school. She became uh, close to me. She would come and pick me in the holidays, bring me to town where she was living, have holidays with her. Uh, I would grudgingly go back to my home village. Uh, because the standards were totally different. I was living in a very poor environment. I had enough to eat, yes, but uh, the life was not compared to what I saw in my father's house. 
and what I saw in my mother's house. So I had that uh, uh, inequality as a child, and I started thinking I was an inferior child. I was questioning why my father kept me in the village, in a poor environment, yet my siblings were in a very good environment. And equal, I was also questioning in my mind, why does my mother leave me in this poor home, yet she has a good uh, home? So those are the questions in my mind, and I grew up with a bit of stigma, seeing myself as an inferior child. Now, men, I think you can see what it means to go into those extra affairs. You can see the challenges you create, for, even for your offspring. I'm not saying this with bitterness. I've just come to share my story. Because when we share, perhaps God guides our, our next steps. Fortunately, life at school was very good. I, I, it was a very active school. and. Uh, when I went back to school, the studies would engage me and I forget about my misery. In upper primary, my mother moved me to uh, my grandfather's home, her father, very close to town here, where there I was. I think she thought it was a better school. And when I went there, yes, I did well and eventually ended up in King's College Budo for my secondary. I told you I had picked some Christian values and when I went to Budo, uh, it, uh, there was a group of saved students who approached me to receive salvation. I refused because I thought I was already a good Christian. And in the school, it was a Christian school strictly. And we went for compulsory chapel, just like in primary we had uh, compulsory prayers, which I don't regret at all. And uh, at Budo, I was a very disciplined chap thinking I was good. But when these boys came to talk about salvation, I thought it was not necessary. Am, am I going to be bored, locked up? Maybe if I, want to if I desire to do something wrong, and then you are blocking me because I'm saved? It's that fear which really held me long without receiving salvation. Okay? So I rejected, and life went on. But I was a member of the school choir because I was singing in primary. And here I was in a school choir. In fact, I even learned to play the piano. I would go to chapel and play even the hymns by senior three. And many students, in fact, thought I was saved because of playing the piano and being gentle. But surely inside me, I had some sinful thoughts. But I thought I was okay because I don't steal, I don't, I'm kind to people. And I thought these were small sins. Can you imagine? I thought these are small sins. God can even forgive me because these are small sins. So that's the life I lived. And my yardstick was those boys who were terrible. When I compared myself to those terrible boys, I thought I was okay after all. Why should I get... You see how so and so behaves. I'm not like them. In fact, I was your typical Pharisee, <laughs> thinking I am complying with the laws. But surely, how many laws was I keeping? Just a few. And... Uh, I refused to receive salvation. And then I moved on with that attitude. When I was with the teachers and the elders, they thought I was a very good boy. And yet I had some ill thoughts. Then later on, I had to move on to higher studies, eventually graduated, and I still remained in church. I would go to a church and even play on Sundays, play the organ, and people would see me as a very, first of all, I was a bit quiet. I'm going to church, I'm playing the piano. So I was the model boy, and everybody praised me for being a good boy. But inside me, I had, I had some ill thoughts here and there, telling some lies once in a while. But still, people approached me to receive salvation. Do you know what I was telling them? Because of my gentility, and not wanting to annoy them, I would say, please pray for me. But inside me, I, don't, I didn't even have an intention of getting saved. But here I was saying, please pray for me. Just hoodwink people to cool off, think I'm a good person. But I surely didn't want to receive salvation at that time. I met my wife, Proskovia, after school. And uh, I took her to my mother before even introduction. My mother approved her. I remember telling her one thing, which I thank God for up to today. 
I told her, Mommy, help me, pray for me, so that I never get any other woman other than proscovia. Mm -hmm. Even in my unsaved state, I made that request for prayer. Mm -hmm. And my mother said, I will pray, without even uh, asking me, why have you said that? And I thank God that this was to be a blessing to my family later on. That commitment I made that please, mommy, pray for me so that I never get any other woman on top of Proscovia. So she took me to her parents, introduced me, and uh, at that time I didn't even have intentions of making a marriage, uh, a, a, a church ceremony. I thought maybe these are complicated processes, they demand a lot of money, they are unnecessary. So my spokesman went and deceived the parents that we are going to wed in church very soon. And for me, I got happy that I now have my wife. We started living together. She was so faithful to me. Uh, she was not demanding that I must take her to church. We lived that life. We went to church. We went to church. We were preached to. People were preaching salvation. And I thought, no, for me, I'm a good Christian. After all, I've seen some saved people now making mistakes. Why don't I remain the way I am? So I started getting battles. People saying, but you are doing good acts. The Lord is not interested in good acts per se, but it's your heart first he wants to possess. And I thought, no, God cannot, cannot fail to be pleased when I'm doing good things. So I still stuck there. Preachers would come to church and preach, and at the end of the sermon, they will make an altar call, say, who want to receive salvation? Come here. I would want to... I started feeling like I should go, but then another force was saying, no, don't go. It's not necessary. Then at the end of the day, they would ask, how many of you have received salvation? Of course, my hand was not there. And then they would say, how many of you have not received salvation? Again, my hand was not there. Then the preachers would tease us and say, hey, but how come some of you don't belong anywhere? You see how I was got, getting convicted because I was living a pretentious life. I want to be called a good man, but I've not accepted salvation. In fact, saved people would call me, would greet me thinking I'm saved, say, praise God. As you know, the saying is, I'll say, amen, praise him. But inside me, I was not born again. So that contradiction remained and it started haunting me. I started to question, but I'm doing good things for the Lord. I'm refusing to get saved. In fact, I started admiring people who were saved. But it was even a free thing and I was not accepting. You see the dilemma? Yet I'm interested in going to church. Sometimes I serve in this and this. But I'm receiving to receive salvation. We are not even getting Holy Communion with my wife, as you know, because we were not qualifying. So that contradiction went on. It took um, a, a priest to come to my house and asked me, because I think they were confused by my status, uh, John, are you married in church? I said, no, why? You can imagine how do you answer that question. You have a wife, you're not married in church. How do you answer that question? I don't remember what I would answer, but it started convicting me. At the same time, I was drinking a little beer and a little wine because I was having good jobs. I had some money. Mm -hmm. I thought, ah, putting a beer out two in my fridge, it's okay. After all, I don't go to bars. You see, I am using the people who go to, 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 uh, to the bars as a yardstick. Me, I don't go to bars. I can drink my beer from home. After all, I don't get even drunk. My wife is not complaining. Doctor said it's good for your stomach. What is the problem? So I remain like that, drinking a little modestly. All right? But then when I knew that a priest was going to visit me or some the same people are going to visit, then I would hide the, the bottles from the fridge. Because now the dining hall, what if the reverend is seated in the dining hall and then someone opens the, the fridge and then the, then the reverend will see my beer bottles and say, hey, I thought this man was sick. So I was hiding those bottles away. When they go, then I return them. I was not drinking daily, but maybe after two days, something small. And I thought, it's okay, I'm not a drunkard. 
But these are the things which locked me in that unsaved state. Thinking I'm good, yet I'm not good. I, am, I fall short on very many things. However, that priest made an impact on me. Because after about two weeks, I made a decision, told my wife, we must go and get married. She was very happy. And we told people, we organized a very simple wedding, which by God's grace um, turned out to be very good. Immediately after my wedding, I was appointed to the parish council. Can you imagine? That's when I realized people have been interested in me, but this has been locking me. Then I thought, ah, now that I'm married, it's okay. But where? It's not okay. I am still unsaved, very prone to sin. I've never repented. But that was the idea. But I kept on like that, started serving in church very devotedly. In fact, I wanted to serve church. In fact, I love the priests, gentlemen, sisters and brothers. I love the priests. I love the priests. And I never opposed God right from my childhood. I understood God is the principal, is the author of life. He is the decider. I knew that very well. And I never challenged. I would ch ch serve willingly in church. I would contribute willingly, but still not receiving salvation. Thinking this is not necessary. And that's the life I lived. But it started haunting me. I started seeing emptiness in my life. Saying now, where do I belong, surely? I don't want to belong to the evil world. But I also don't want to belong to God to declare... Where am I? It took some time when I was really feeling empty in my life. I had good income. I had a family. I had a loving wife. We didn't have serious married, uh, marital issues. When we got a few misarguments, it was okay, short-lived, because in the end we loved each other. So the home was very stable. People admired us. I was generous to my relatives. I was generous to people. And uh, that's the life we lived. But I was feeling empty in life. I would worry even over small things. What will my future be like? You are okay today, but then you are worried, how shall I be in the future? How will my kids be? Uh, what about my developments? But you are okay, everything is flowing well, but you have those worries. In fact, I feared the death so much. There's nothing I feared like death at that time. Okay? So I was engaged in these worries. When, uh, no matter my standard of living, no matter my education, I, was, I had a vote in my life. And I was not satisfied at all. I started questioning, where do I belong? I refused to receive salvation. Yet it was free. Now I'm questioning, do you see how Satan works in us and ties us on chains? All right? Cut the wrong story short. Uh, yes, I wanted to, I, I shouldn't skip this because, because I think even priests had seen my pretentious nature. And the one time I went to visit a certain priest, and uh, take some Christmas goodies. And when I was leaving, the priest prayed for me. But I remember the priest saying in the end statement, God help this gentleman so and so to get saved completely. Ah. I felt embarrassed. I felt embarrassed. So I went home. I felt embarrassed, but I didn't blame the reverend because that was the thing. He had seen that I'm not saved. But now he's being polite to say, God help this man to become saved completely. Can you be saved halfway? You are either saved or you are not. But I could not blame the gentleman because he had sinned. And that was another conviction. But I still say don't like that. Now, when does my turning point come? One evening, I was called by one of my friends to go and look at his school project. You can see how God works in mysterious ways. This man calls me to go and look at his project. And that day, I got very tired at work. When I reached home, I called him to say, I'm not coming, I'm so tired, I just want to rest. The man said, no, please come. He's a very persuasive man. Please come and just look at the project. After all, you helped me contribute. How oh, come and look at it, just that, and then you go home. I said, okay, let me go. So when I reached there, uh, we toured, we toured, I was impressed. Then I said, let me go home. Then he said, no, there is a, a fellowship here. I want you to join us. I said, no, please. I told you I'm already very tired. I want to go and have my dinner and rest. Now again, you are, please, I'm not coming. He said, no, please, John, come. 
very persuasive man. Then I, when I looked where he wanted me to go to share in a fellowship, first of all, at that time when I had the fellowship, I would connect it to people who are going to start saying, now we want you to get saved. And I would be uncomfortable. So this time, when I looked at the group where they were seated, I saw men from my church. I saw men from my church. I also saw Dr. Rutaja. I never met him in person, but because he had been, been a popular man in the past, I knew him very well by the press. But when I saw these people in, from my church who I knew were saved, then I said, ah, is this friend trapping me to go now to be lectured about salvation? That was the question. But then all of a sudden a thought came in my mind, I'll never forget. All of a sudden a thought came. After all, salvation is a good thing. You go and listen to what they say. I relaxed. And that was the beginning of my turning point. That thought came very vividly. After all, salvation is a good thing. You go and listen. Even if they are to talk about it, what's the problem? So I relaxed, went and sat there. They introduced themselves. It turned out to be that that was the new chapter of Muyenga, businessmen, the full gospel business, uh, businessmen's fellowship, where I'm also a member. Now, it turned out that was the new chapter, and Dr. Rutaji had been invited to speak. So people introduced themselves, and I was given the last opportunity, and I introduced myself. And then Dr. Rutaji asked, John, are you saved? Can you imagine the fear I had? Now the question is coming. <laughs> but again, because of that thought, this time I never feared that question. But I used the previous gimmick of saying, I'm not saved yet, but please pray for me. But now this time the idea was changing. The idea was now changing. So they talked, talked, uh, he talked, started to present. Very interesting story, very interesting story. I could see that I was relating with him in the many stages of his life. Now he came to a point where he said, he was of course being very stubborn also. He was reading the Bible, he read it very many times, but only to challenge God. It's like he was looking for, to, to, to disprove the Bible several times. But then he had his other, his other struggles with life. And he was refusing to get salvation. He, was, he had a very good education, as you know. He was privileged in life. But again, he said he, his life had been empty for a very long time. And I realized at that time my life was empty. Despite my possessions, des, despite my stable home, I was empty. So, he talked. And he talked in the end, he said, one day, one of his saved friends engaged him finally. Why should not receive salvation? Why is it refusing? And the way God does his things, Dr. Rutaji told us, his friend told him, Rutaji, you received salvation long ago, but you are just refusing. That was the snapshot. That's where God pressed the button. I vividly saw now that I, I received salvation long ago. First of all, I went to very good schools, Christian schools. I was modeled, and that's what was making me live a good life, a good education. I am in church. I love church. I don't hate church. In fact, preachers would preach, and I feel I should be saved. But somehow, the chain was there to hold me. I said to myself immediately, I received salvation long ago. I am just refusing it. That was the snapshot. Mm. It was an accidental visit, first of all. I had been invited. I got so tired during the day, I was not going to go. The man persuaded me, I went. I didn't think there was going to be a fellowship. The man persuaded me, I almost refused. Now I ended there. So the fellowship ended, but I never concentrated on the rest of Dr. Rutaji's talk. I started having tears in my heart right from that fellowship. I started having tears in my heart. I went home for dinner and I had my dinner rested. My wife, did, of course she knew I had gone to visit but she didn't know what was going on in my mind. 
at night I was full of tears in my heart. I was seeing how I have been rebellious to God. No matter all the opportunities, I don't belong anywhere. What am I doing? I cried. I think that is the biggest battle I had, I've ever had in my life. Around 4 a.m., I got off my bed and knelt and prayed and received salvation. Now, the following, I didn't want to disturb my work, wake her up. No, I kept quiet. The following morning, because she wakes up much earlier than me, I met her downstairs. I told her, do you know, I've also received salvation. She was, of course, very happy. Now, my main question was, but my wife has never declared salvation. How do I start her now to receive salvation? That, because my wife was part of me. Yes. How do I convince her to receive salvation? Only to realize later, when I was talking to her, that for her she had received salvation and decided to ignore me because I was contented with my life. She thought maybe she would hurt me because I didn't have any obvious sins, as you know. Mm. I'm not having a summary affairs, I'm not cheating people. So for me, that was the yardstick. And she thought I was okay after all. But also, maybe I would be disturbed by her because men tend to reject some of their women's initiatives. I think she, be she thought I should better leave this man. And then I was happy, of course, that she had already received it, but I was embarrassed at the same time. My wife received salvation before me and they didn't tell me. And yet I'm not a bad man. We love one another. We've been together. What a contradiction. I'm to blame because I'm the family head. Mm. So the next question that day was, how do I go to declare to a church where I've been pretending for all these years <laughs> that I've received salvation today? How do I go and declare? At that time, I, I think I was the chairman building committee. Can you imagine? <laughs> Making night wo nice words, they are appearing for fans and all that. Nice words. Never receive salvation. Now that was another battle. The last one. How do I go and declare? Do you know that Satan can block you again? Because that embarrassment, how do you prepare for it? But God had prepared me. There was no turning back. I said I must go and humble myself. The days of confusion are over. I want to belong somewhere. I will go. Whatever embarrassment, I deserve it because I've been disobeying God. I will go. God had prepared me. I went with that zeal. When I went, that day I was supposed to preside over a small fundraising, one of the services. I did it, prepared. I prepared for surprising them. At the end of it, I talked about my struggles with the Lord, and people were tense. Because remember, some of them knew I was already saved, which I was not. Then I declared now. And uh, some members were happy, especially the born again, they came, sang the 10 days, it thundered. But I noticed that very many, actually, the majority didn't have any change on their faces. I noticed that there are two options. Either they are just so surprised or they are identifying with my struggles and they have not made a decision. Because how come others are very happy and others, they don't have an expression? <laughs> so I detected that. But, gentlemen, I felt, do you know when you are carrying 100 kilograms on your head, this time I felt like I've lifted this, that very time when I was around the altar, I felt light. I felt a lot of peace by that declaration. I felt a lot of peace. I had never. I don't think I've, I, I ever had a happier day than that, because I felt now I changed the man. I have now withstood the embarrassment. It's over. Me, I've declared to my Lord, my relationship is more valuable than my status. Mm. My status is fake. It doesn't matter. Mm. I have declared. I was very happy. I felt a new man. But do you know what happened after the service? My wife told me, some ladies came to her and said, Hey, we thought this man was saved long ago. He's just telling us he's saved today. Of course, my wife was embarrassed. I don't know what she told them. Then others said, Oh, thank you very much for working on your man. You know, men are difficult. You have done a good job today, as I declare. But the fact of the matter is, 
it was not her. Maybe she was praying for me, but surely the initial button was pressed by God through this businessmen's fellowship. How come I'd listened to so many sermons and they never changed me? This testimony, life testimony, changed my life. Amen. And I went and started a new life. I went and started a new life and I was telling people I've received salvation. It, I had separated from a few of my friends. Uh, first of all, I was not going to buzz, but the few of the friends I would meet maybe for business ventures, I saw, I didn't like their, some of their attitude, but I would just go for the sake of this and leave. But some of them were not happy with me. In fact, I remember the day when I went for a certain function and uh, uh, it was an introduction function and we were serving beers and they brought to me a beer because they knew I was a tech tech. I said, to, I'm a saved man, these days I don't take beers. There was an old man who became so infuriated. He told me, now you can become a reverend. <laughs> can you imagine? By, by just telling him, this, I am saved. I am saved, I don't take beers anymore. <laughs> the man said, for that matter, you can become a reverend. He even made an expression to, to ward me off. Because I was not belonging to a general happiness. But I didn't mind. I didn't mind. Anyway, my life changed. I, my prayer life now increased. In the past, I would pray occasionally, especially when I had the problems. I remember to pray. I would read the Bible very rarely. When the preacher said, you go and read this and this, I would read. Once I say, I leave it there. Then I would say, oh, let me go and start reading at least one chapter a week. I failed. I failed. So my prayer life now changed. Immediately one of my old friends and schoolmates, who is a very big man, the professor of medicine, when I told him, because the, one of the people who first approached me, when I told him, I was very happy. He said, now you go and also join the uh, Bible Fellowship International, which I joined. And it also played a very big role in changing my life. In the past, I would read the Bible like a novel, not understanding understanding a few things, but not applying them. But with the discipline of BSF, whatever I read and whatever I read now, I pay attention to what is God saying. So my life changed, my home changed, uh, my kids, fortunately, all of them received salvation and I admire them because me, I was a late comer. But uh, what I want to say, what have I learned out of my experiences? I have learned that refusing to receive salvation, you are guaranteeing an empty life for yourself. And you are a subject of severe attacks by Satan. For example, you are, you, are, you are in marriage, you are not married in church, you don't have any contract. It's very easy to say, after all, I'm not uh, 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 bound to this lady, you can go and do other things. And you know the destruction that can come. So, the longer you delay to receive salvation, uh, the more you expose yourself to Satan. Because you are going to live an empty life, you cannot control anything after all. But when you receive salvation and start depending on God, your everyday step is guided. You hear people saying, I was lucky to have this, I was lucky to get this. Then I question myself, what is the definition of luck? Where does it originate from? Who controls, is, who controls luck so that it can go to so and so, it can go to so and so, it doesn't come to me. And we confusing God's power and blessings with a phenomena we don't understand, that mindset of luck for me now doesn't exist. And that's why I appeal to us to evaluate our own work, especially the young people. The world is, 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 is troubling. Whether you have money, whether you are rich, whether you are highly educated, these troubles are going to be right with you. But for me today, these troubles are cushioned. When I received salvation after that, I got the biggest challenges in my life. The biggest. I had two surgeries. One of them almost took me. When I went to that surgery, the second one, I prayed to God, help me to overcome this surgery. But if it is your will that my life ends here, 
help me to look after my family because my family was very close to me. My mother is still living, still strong, around 81, 82. But uh, I would never think about her before my family. I didn't even pray about my mother. I said, if you have to take me, look after my family. And I had peace that day. And that is peace I had never experienced. Because when I went to the surgery table, the surgeon measured my pressure and said, Oh, John, you are okay. Everything is okay. Your very stable pressure is good because the Lord had prepared me. When I was, before you entered that surgery room, it was in South Africa, and uh, we went to a, a room where there were very many theaters in that hospital, very it's a big hospital. So I was on my bed. And the surgeon himself was pushing my trolley, can you imagine? Not even the nurses. And was taking me to a lift to another ward, a uh, surgery room. I saw very many people lined for surgery, over 30, going to different theaters, some white, some Asian, some. And a vision came to me, I think it was a vision, say, ah, death looks like an airport. Eh? How come there are these people going there, going there? <laughs> and some are going to die, and it's possible that I'm also going to die. But I had a peace still, say, hey, death is like an airport. That's the vision which came immediately. And the Lord had prepared me. I didn't care. If God is to call me, it's okay. Ah, and that's how I ended there. I recovered. I came back. And uh, determined to continue serving God in my own capacity. When I go to people, I tell them, the work I do, my management skills have even improved because in the past I was a person who could lose temper and back. I was not easy to forgive, but these are things which came after that because I identify myself as a sinner. I'm conscious of my own sin and I must tolerate others. My duty is to tolerate them and then together we move on and improve our lives. Before salvation, I was even opposed to the law of the Sabbath. When I thought I was very busy, I had important work to do, I should go and work on a Sunday after all. But I knew the law. Yet I was saying I didn't need his salvation. One day God punished me. I had bought a small car for my wife. And I said, I'm not going to go to church today because on Monday I won't have time to fix the new tires. You know, they come with old tires. Hey, let me go to, to the shops, buy these tires, fix them. That was a Sunday. This time I should not go to church. As soon as I reached the shop, robbers came with guns and locked us in there. They stole all the money in the shop. They touched my pocket. I think he got excited by the phone. He took it out. He had stepped on me, guns pointing, lie down or we shoot you. But I was terrified. That day I thought I was going to die. I was shaking. I thought I was going to die. And my thought came, why did I dodge church today? <laughs> now I'm going to die here. I am going to leave my children. I never experienced a gun at that level. Someone pointing a gun at me. These people were very fierce. So I was terrified, shook. I was shaking all over. Even when they finished their robbing mission and went out, I think I was like a dead person. Then I heard one of the shop attendants saying, Bagenze. Then I looked around, surely they had gone. But they, again, they had, uh, they had uh, pushed the door back and nobody will see. So we came out running. People say, we have seen them. They have even poured some money here to confuse us. They have gone, they have gone. So they went. I regretted. Why did I dodge church today? That was my last time to disrespect the law of the Sabbath. I learned the hard way. I had a long battle, but I thank God that I finally arrived. And it's my prayer that everybody, the earlier you identified uh, uh, your position, and moved on in case you are not yet there, the better. So this is my humble sharing I had to give today. Thank you for inviting me. May God bless you all. Wow. Have you ever imagined that each time you share your testimony, it blesses people and it's the reason some people are transformed? Without Dr. Rutaji's story, maybe we wouldn't have had Mr. Guy, John Bugembe, but 
he receives Christ because of the testimony he hears from someone else. That is why you too need to always share with others your story. And it is the reason we have the Transformed Lives program show only on Church of Uganda Family TV. But I also want to remind you that as Full Gospel Business Men's Fellowship, we have our international president visiting Uganda between 5th and 7th of June. Therefore, you are all invited to be part of our life-changing testimony uh, conferences at Protea Hotel, starting from morning to evening. God will bless you, I believe. Come with a friend, come with an unbeliever. Oh, if you feel burdened, come and listen to these transformational stories and your life will not be the same again. God bless you. Until we meet again next time.